Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to, today, to today's webinar, The Best Story Always Wins, How to Develop and Deliver a Compelling Story. My name is Steve Jones, Vice President of Global Demand Marketing here at Corporate Visions, and I'll be moderating today's event. Uh, before we get started, I'd uh, like to go over a few housekeeping items so you know how to participate in today's event. Uh, we've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. You've joined the presentation using your computer speaker system by default, but if you prefer to join over the telephone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You'll have the opportunity uh, to submit text questions today to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation, and we'll go ahead and collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Um, also, as a reminder, following the event, we'll be sending all attendees uh, the recording of today's webcast as well uh, within 24 to 48 hours. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to introduce Tim Reeser, Chief Strategy Officer at Corporate Visions. Tim, the floor is yours. All right, Steve. Thanks. I appreciate the opportunity and everybody joining us here today. Um, it's September 8th, and, and today is a... Um, Big day in storytelling history as far as I'm concerned, um, and, and maybe it doesn't jump out at any of you as a big day in storytelling history, but on this day in 1974, my childhood hero uh, told a fabulous story that caused millions of people to spend their hard-earned dollars to buy what at that time was called closed-circuit closed circuit television, today called pay-per-view, uh, to watch this daredevil who invented, based on story, an entire sport of jumping motorcycles over cars. And he now professed he was going to jump a super motorcycle, really a rocket, over a canyon. And he did so on this date in 1974. The only problem with his story is it didn't have a very happy ending. He, the parachute deployed early. He, he, he sunk to the bottom of the canyon, didn't make the jump. But somehow, uh, this spectacular stunt that failed miserably made him about $10 million in 1974 dollars richer, and so his story made him a winner. Just as a way of demonstrating my love and affection and, and the fact that he's a great storyteller and was one of my heroes in my, as child, and that his storytelling inspired me to be a storyteller, here's a picture from Christmas 1973 with me and my evil Knievel stuff. And uh, the rest is, I guess, shall we say, history. Now, whether or not that had anything to do with what I'm going to talk about today doesn't matter because I just checked a bucket list item, which was I got to talk about my childhood hero in a national, international webcast. So thank you for that today. All right, here's what we're really going to talk about in terms of storytelling today. I have in front of you a typical buying cycle where the customer begins by thinking about the fact that they don't have any worries, concerns, or troubles and eventually makes their way across the buying cycle where they decide they need to do something different and change. And then they eventually decide which vendor partner they're going to choose, and then they make a decision to do something different. Nothing fancy here. You've all seen this. You've probably all seen this next statistic I'm about to show as well, and that is this idea that somewhere between 57% and some people saying 70%, so I took a round number, 60%, of buyers believe that they're that far along in the buying cycle, not 60% of buyers, I'm sorry, buyers believe they're 60% of the way through the buying cycle before they ever ask for or desire to encounter a salesperson. This is what buyers believe, and that's the story they're telling all of us, and I hear this repeated everywhere, and I want to just go on the record as saying is I think it's a bunch of bunk. The reason I think that's a bunch of bunk is because at the same time that buyers think and feel and give you the opinion that they believe they're 60% of the way along, 60% of the time, they make no decision. They decide not to do anything different. And so I would argue that they feel and think they're 60% of the way done because they've done a lot of heavy lifting and a lot of research, but they're not actually 60% of the way done in the decision-making process because the great, great vast majority of them make no decision. The 60% no decision number is based on looking at over 300 sales CRM systems. So this isn't the top of the funnel leads we're talking about. 
these are customer prospects who said, I think I want to do something different. And then salespeople spent cycles on both your side and your competitor's side, and they ended up doing nothing. So my challenge to you today is where and how do you need to fashion your story, and is it based on what the um, – 60% of the way through the buying cycle, or is it based on the fact that the majority of people at the end of the buying cycle don't do anything? I would suggest that the story you need to tell is the early stage why change story, because the majority of customers, even in your qualified pipeline, let alone your funnel, are still trying to decide if they even need to do anything different. This number here, 74 and 26, Forrester identified that 74% of executive buyers said they give the business to the company who helped them create the buying vision. In other words, the company that inspired them to make the change, the one who convinced them to do something different, the one who helped them see their status quo is no longer safe, is the one who wins and the one who gets the deal most often. If you wait to participate later on, you may get into a competitive bake-off and have a one in four chance of winning, but you significantly increase the odds if you have helped set up that bake-off. Now, this may be truth that everyone's accepted, but the question has really become, how do I actually do it? You've always heard, get in early and you know, speak to the needs of the customer, help them see the need to change. How do you do that? There's actually a science behind it. And because there's science behind it, I want to tell you today that story building and storytelling that wins deals actually has got science behind it. You can't create content just because it's clever and believe it's going to win. You need to create content on purpose that you know is going to win because you know what it takes to cause a decider to decide and someone to actually make a change and actually take a decision or to show an intent to take a decision. So I want to teach you quickly about status quo bias, and there are four causes of it. I want to teach you the four ways you can defeat the causes of status quo bias, which is your real enemy, not your competitors. It's the desire not to change. There's four causes and four ways to address it and give you that as a template for creating content and creating stories that actually cause people to move the needle towards change. And this can be a framework for those of you who are marketing message creators and those of you who are sellers who have to deliver that message. This is a framework you need to consider, and I give this to you as a tool today. The first thing you need to know is that when you're talking to a prospect or customer, the reason they're wanting to stick with their status quo bias is because they have something and they suffer from something called preference stability. That means that they look at the prior decisions they've made and they look at how hard it was to make that decision, what a heavy lift that was. Not only the decision process, then the implementation process. And what they do is when they hear a new message, the first natural instinct of human beings, and, and your buyers are human beings, your deciders are human beings, is to say, I think that's a lot like uh, what I'm already doing. And what you're hearing when people say it's a lot like what I'm already doing is preference stability. They want to stabilize their currently held preferences by making your thing that you think is new seem just like what they're doing. So the enemy of your message is this idea that they're going to say it's like what they're already doing. So you can't let that happen. The first an, an sort of response and answer to that is your messages need to deliberately destabilize their currently held preferences. You need to know what their preferences are and help them see why that status quo preference is no longer safe, no longer sustainable, no longer tenable, no longer scalable, whatever it might be. And I'm going to give you an example and a test we've done to prove that. The second cause of the status quo bias that, that you must build your story to address is the idea of the cost of change. The perception is that the status quo is free. I've gone through the pain. I've gone through the investment. It's now just part of our normal operating procedure and our normal operating budget. So in essence, it's already paid for. And so this idea of changing to something new and doing something new makes me think of costs. I'm going to have to procure some extra budget. I'm going to have to open up the budget discussion. I'm going to have to, it's going to cost me time to get consensus among all the decision makers. It's going to cost me stomach lining, et cetera. There's a high cost associated with change. And the problem is that's where your customer prospects go when they read your new message, this idea, this big new thing you've got. They're like, yeah, well, 
I, I don't have the appetite to go get the budget for that or go through the, the cost of changing. Your challenge to defeat that is to make sure your messages, your stories, actually show them there's a cost of staying the same. And the cost of staying the same is actually greater than the cost of change. When you build messages to defeat status quo bias, to build a buying vision and help people see the need to change, you have to see these things inside your story. And I've got a study and an example I want to show you of that in a minute. The third cause of the status quo bias that you must address in your messaging and your stories and your storytelling is this idea of selection difficulty. It's very hard for a prospect or customer to see anything really that different between what they're doing and what you're offering or what the competitive alternatives are. And in general, they do a very superficial look at that and assume everything's the same and it paralyzes the decision and makes it that much easier to just put things on hold, drag things out, or in fact stick with the status quo. The challenge for you is to make sure that you help and that your stories help the customer see clear enough contrast and sufficient enough contrast before and after. What they're doing today, current state, and what you're recommending they do differently and better tomorrow, future state, in that contrast. And then between you and the competitive alternatives, you must create enough sense of contrast in order to overcome this idea of paralyzing selection difficulty. We'll talk about how to do that as well today. And finally, the fourth thing we're going to talk about is the fact that human beings are great. I just love human beings. Before anything happens, our natural instinct isn't to project success. Our natural instinct is to anticipate regret and blame for making any kind of decision and go through all the possible machinations as to how this could ruin our reputation, how this could hurt my position, and um, that is natural. That is part of the status quo bias. It causes people to say, you know what, where I'm at might, right now might not be pretty, but I'm not dead yet. And this other thing you're telling me to do, that could kill me. So you have to conclude your story with a before and after hero story that shows someone making it through this entire process, starting in a similar place as the person you're talking to and succeeding on the other side of um, this program to help them overcome the anticipated regret and blame. I'm going to walk you through exactly what that sounds like, looks like, and means. So what I've done is created essentially a, a template for something I like to say and call insights that incite. So much of what you're trying to do anymore these days in the why change world and creating a buying vision is to share an insight. And it's a word that's tossed all around and it's kind of the vogue word for storytelling. Um, but the problem is a lot of insights generate excite by, by means of getting leads and getting people in the pipeline. But clearly with the amount of people sticking with no decision status quo, they're not doing enough to insight change. So here's your template. Your stories must contain these four things. Something that destabilizes their current preferences, something that shows the cost of staying the same, something that creates enough contrast, and something that helps them see the before and after hero story and identify with that hero. So let's tackle each one of these now, and I share an example or idea for how to do this in your messaging and a test we've done to prove that this actually does incite the kind of behavior and decision-making you're looking for. So in the first case, let's talk about this need to create a buying vision to, by destabilizing preferences. The first thing that I have to tell you is that if you are one of those people who relies on voice of the customer research and tries to identify the known uh, needs of the customer and then believes you should map those needs to your capabilities, congratulations, that is a very solid traditional solution selling value proposition model. But I'm going to offer today that that actually contributes to status quo bias and that people believe that it leads to a commoditized conversation. The reason being is that you're not the only one asking customers those questions, and you're not the only one the customers are expressing essentially the same needs to. And then when you map those to your capabilities, you're mapping them to the most natural capabilities that um, respond to and solve for those needs, and your portfolio, to be honest, isn't that different from your competitor's portfolio. So while you're doing, the same, you're, while you're doing what you think is exactly right, you're doing the exact same thing and ending up with some of the same results, contributing to status quo bias because no one can really see anything too different. And they also, you don't upset their current preferences because if somebody tells you about a need they know, it doesn't mean they're not trying to solve it today. It just means they're not sure they're solving it as well as they could. 
And, and the challenge in that is that the customer may look at your solution and doing something different as being more painful and difficult than the pains they're suffering with now. And, and so what really causes urgency to make a change is actually the uncertainty or destabilizing of their current preferences, including telling them something they maybe didn't already know. But the problem is most companies react this way. You say, oh, wow, look, there's a bunch of unknown strengths that the customer doesn't know about, doesn't care about. What I need to do is um, begin to introduce those into the story. And if I can introduce those unknown strengths or capabilities into the story for the customer, that will help me differentiate. And this may sound familiar in your company because you call these value-added services. And so the opportunity to create some urgency and some uniqueness, you think, is by introducing value-added services into your story. And that's going to cause people to go, wow, this is different. I need to change because I don't have those things. And the challenge is that you may call them value-added services, but the research has shown, and it's identified and documented as something called uh, choice overload, that these extras that you call value-added services are perceived to only add cost and add complexity, not add value. So the problem with introducing and shoehorning value-added services in for differentiation is that you think that, but the customer doesn't see it that way, view it that way, or react to it that way. That the only way that you're going to help destabilize someone's preferences is by helping them see that there are needs or problems or situations or opportunities they didn't even know they had. That there are unconsidered needs. Let's say there are business challenges or threats that maybe they're aware of, but they didn't realize the size and the speed with which they were coming at them. You need to amplify the size and the speed of those problems so that the customer puts them to the top of their checklist, and then they can be resolved by something that you do. The other thing is maybe it's a problem that the customer's masked and worked around for so long, they don't even remember it's a problem. There you got to peel back the Band-Aid and reveal to them, hey, maybe you've got something here that won't scale, that won't respond, won't get you to your next level, and, and this is why. You have to reveal that to them. And the third thing is maybe they just didn't even know there was a problem and you have a fix for something, you have to introduce that problem to them because what they were going through was just the way things were and you have to tell them they don't have to be that way. So there are unconsidered needs, but the key is then linking to un unknown strengths. Most people say, where do you find an unconsidered need? Well, the unconsidered need is what destabilizes their preferences because it's a surprise and it creates a risk they didn't expect, but you also must be able to resolve that risk and it must uh, then land on something you do well and you do distinctively from your competitors. We've done the tests on this to identify that there is a storytelling model here that has greater impact and defeats the status quo. Working with experts in persuasion and negotiations, Dr. Tormala and Dr. Neal, Corporate Visions has done some exclusive extensive research with these really smart people who also happen to be employed at the Stan Stanford University Graduate School of Business. And the first test I want to tell you about is the idea of an unconsidered need. This idea that if you tell somebody something they didn't know, you're going to provoke them out of their status quo bias. Yes or no? Let's find out if it really works. Not, let's not guess. Let's find out. So what we did is we created four standard messages slash pitches. And the idea was the customer prospect had to decide which one of these was the most different, the most unique, and ultimately we ask them which one they would probably purchase and buy from. And we put these prospect customers in a situation where they saw themselves as legitimately having to make a business decision. And the standard pitch was simply responding to the known stated customer needs and then credentialing your organization and then showing how you'd solve the problem. The value added pitch did the same thing, identified and confirmed the business needs, credentialed the company, solve the problem, and then introduce a couple distinguishing value-added services. The unconsidered need last introduced and confirmed the business problems, but then at the end talked about something the customer didn't think of and didn't expect. And then the unconsidered need first pitch opened with a surprising, interesting need, consideration challenge that the customer didn't know and had not expressed, and then eventually talked to solving the problem. But first, introduced an unconsidered need, then talked about um, an unknown strength, and then resolved the known needs. Four pitches, here's the reactions. You, 
can get a 50% boost in differentiation and uniqueness. Two really big goals of most insights and most messages and most stories. Hey, I got to be different. I got to be seen as unique. Well, you better tell the customer something they didn't know. That in fact, just repeating what they already told you and confirming the needs that they already identified did not make you a trusted advisor. It made you a tape recorder. And customers are looking for a trusted advisor, and trusted advisor shows up and you actually tell them something they didn't tell you and didn't already know. So you get a 50% bump just by introducing an unconsidered need into your messaging. So then we wanted to find out if it changed the perception of the quality of the institution, the quality of the presentation itself, the quality of the presenter. So we ask a range of questions, and it turns out that the quality of the presenter, the presentation, the message, and the institution, if you will, vendor itself, gets a bump if you introduce an unconsidered need, but only if you do it at the beginning of your pitch and of your message. If you want to build a story that causes people to see you as a higher quality presenter and higher quality presentation and a higher quality company, introduce an unconsidered need. But the only one that statistically significantly outperformed the others was if you put it first in the presentation. You literally opened with it and told somebody something they didn't know before you ever regurgitated um, uh, the things that they knew and confirmed the things they told you. A double digit increase in perception of quality. But that's not where the money's made. That's not where the bread is buttered. That happens in persuasion, attitude and choice, the likelihood to choose this vendor, the willingness to pay more for this vendor, et cetera, et cetera. About a list of 10 questions around attitude and choice that we ask people who we were asking to put themselves in the position to decide. And this is what we discovered is the unconsidered need first approach, telling them something they didn't know before reconfirming their, what they did know, had a 10% lift in persuasion, choice, willingness to pay more. So if you're interested in helping create a new preference and destabilizing the existing preference, introducing an unconsidered need into the story that you can resolve distinctly and doing it first at the beginning of your story is absolutely essential. So that's the idea here of destabilizing preferences. Introduce an unconsidered need, tell them about a problem or opportunity they didn't know they had, and make sure it links to something that you do distinctly so that you can introduce the risk and the resolution. The next challenge, the next opportunity, is to uh, overcome the anticipated or projected cost of change by helping them see that there's actually a cost to staying the same. So I want to introduce you to a little bit of science. Um, in the field of decision-making sciences. If you haven't heard of prospect theory and Daniel Kahneman, here you go. And what Daniel Kahneman taught the world 30 years ago and is still relevant today, so relevant that Michael Lewis, the author of Moneyball, uh, The Big Short, and other famous books, one of the most fantastic authors out there, is writing a new book on this guy, Daniel Kahneman and his partner, Amos Tversky, and it's coming out in December. So you're going to want to check that out. If you're a fan at all of decision-making science and behavioral economics, you're going to want to check that out. But he identifies how powerful and how completely transformative this theory is. And if you don't know it, it's absolutely something that you have to integrate into your storytelling. And that is, and it's related to this idea of showing them the cost of staying the same, is that people are more likely to change, more likely to make a decision to do something different, more likely to take a riskier bet in order to avoid a loss versus acquire a gain. Let me repeat that. It's two to three times more likely that someone will change in order to avoid a loss versus go after a potential gain. And what they identified, they called loss aversion. And they doubled down and did some experiments to identify when people will seek risk Will they seek risk more readily to get a gain or to avoid a loss? And they found the same set of circumstances. So here's why I'm telling you this. When you're the person trying to defeat the status quo and replace an incumbent approach, you're not trying to beat a competitor. You're trying to beat inertia. And in order to beat inertia and beat the bias against change, you, have to, you are the risky bet. The safe bet is to keep doing the same. The perception is you're the risky bet. So the question you have to ask yourself is, how do I get someone to take the risky bet? And it turns out they're more likely to take the risky bet if they believe their current situation is going to give them a loss. 
So now, how do you tell that story? We recently did a test, and we recently did a webcast. So if you saw our executive emotions webcast a few weeks back, this might be a repeat, but if you haven't, this is really important. We wanted to find out if prospect theory was true in the executive buying, executive decision-making scenario. So if you're building a story and you're trying to convince business buyers, financial buyers, executive buyers with VP or higher titles, watch this example here. What we did is we identified, working with our partners, 115 VP or level higher titled individuals, a mix of gender, a mix of industry, and a mix of geography. And we divided them into two groups. The first group heard a story that looked like the one you see. Their current approach on the table was to save one out of three automotive plants. We put them in the position of saying you're an executive at an automobile manufacturer, you've hit some tough times, there's a proposal on the table, and, and there's one coming in from an outside vendor. And the current plan, more or less the status quo approach, is you will be able to save one out of your three plants and 2,000 of your 6,000 jobs. But we have a vendor, potential partner, coming in to present to us who's telling us that they have a potential solution. It's not foolproof. It gives us a 33% chance of saving all three plants and jobs, but a 66% chance of actually not saving any. So this is a risky bet. Are you willing to take this chance, Mr. or Mrs. Executive, or do you want to take um, plan A, which is to save one out of the three? Will you take the risk to possibly save all three, but know that you could lose all three? That was one group. The other group, unbeknownst to them, received a different framing of the same math. Look at this side by side. They heard a message that said, two out of the three plants you have are going to be lost, along with 4,000 jobs. Now, what's interesting about this is that it's the exact same math, rationally and logically, as the story on the left-hand side, just positioned in a different frame as loss aversion versus gain attainment. So it's the exact same math, and if, if, if deciders are as logical and as empirical and as rational as they tell us they are, I'm thinking we should get the same results, right? Because the risky bet is actually the same math too. Both plan Bs are the exact same math, just phrased a little differently. In this case, a 66% chance that you're going to lose all three, or a 33% chance that you're going to lose none of them. You get to keep them all. So interestingly, if people are as logical as they tell us the buyers are and that they want their ROI and they want their break even and they want their total cost of ownership and you're asked to do all these calculations because they make a, uh, a numerical decision, then these numbers should have been the same, right? Well, here's what we found out. The executives who were on the left-hand side here, 74% of them chose the save one out of three plants. Only 26% chose the risky bet. Now remember, you're conceived or perceived as the risky bet. Could we change that simply by reframing this as loss aversion? Turns out, absolutely. Look at the dramatic change here that happened when we changed just the words, not the math. We got an increase of 70% who were more persuadable, who were willing to take the risky bet when the original situation was portrayed as a loss aversion story as opposed to a gain attainment story. Why is this so powerful? Why is this something you need to consider? When you're building a story and you want someone to leave their status quo bias and they need to choose a risky bet, which is you, you're the risk, you need to help them see their current state and the cost associated with staying the same and the loss that needs to be avoided if you want any chance of significantly improving the persuadability of your audience to move your direction. Reframe your stories so that you can take advantage of prospect theory, loss aversion and risk seeking, knowingly to help overcome the status quo bias that says they anticipate the cost of change and they think the status quo is free. You must show them the cost of staying the same. All right, on to the third one, creating enough contrast. Now remember, the status quo bias problem here is selection difficulty. Everything looks the same. Contrast is the key to distinguishing yourself when everything looks the same. Here's why. A little more science, and I apologize. A lot of people like me who got into marketing and sales were kind of hoping to avoid science for the rest of their life, but it turns out we can't. So what you need to know is that contrast is really important for the brain to help make a decision because 
in the, in the big pink crinkly part of your brain, the neocortex, you have your analytics, your rational logical thinking. And what we just discovered is that is not actually the deciding part of the brain. What that is, is the justifying, validating, rationalizing part of the brain. It helps explain why you took a decision, but it isn't why you took a decision. Why you took a decision is much more emotional than it is rational, as we just proved in the previous example, and it takes place in a different part of the brain, the limbic system, more specifically the amygdala. And that is not designed for analysis, that's designed for survival. So the decision for change is more decided by survival, which validates everything we just talked about. But you're saying, Tim, you just talked about contrast. Why is it that this part of the brain craves contrast to make that emotional decision? Because this part of the brain does not contain the capacity for language. This part of the brain really is looking at the contrast between their current state and the future state and trying to decide if their survival is at risk to a degree where they need to go someplace else or whether or not they can stay where they are and hope that this shall pass. And the idea is it really depends on how great the contrast is between the current state and the future state. So what I'm saying is that lots of companies go out there with a message or a story that leads with what's new and what's improved. This is what's new and improved. This is what's different about us. And this is the benefit you're going to get, the value you're going to see from this new and improved thing. But I'm here to tell you that by totally leading with the future state, new and improved and what's different, you have not introduced the contrast that the deciding part of the brain needs to perceive the value required to make that shift. All it hears is, is what you say is new and improved and different and better, but as we said, loss aversion kicks in. Yeah, but that still looks hard, that still looks different, I'm kind of risk adver averse, and then all of a sudden they start kicking into preference stability and all the other things I just said. So the idea for overcoming this difficulty is you have to introduce and assign clear descriptors to what the current state is and what most people like them are doing today and what risk that creates and then be able to show the resolution in the future state. The tagline for this is that value does not exist without contrast or the positive value only lies in the contrast. The deciding part of the brain needs contrast to overcome selection difficulty and needs to see enough contrast between what they're doing today and the way you're recommending they do it for them to say, wow, there's enough value for me there to leave this and go there. So you have to show really the combination of the loss of version, the stuff that you know, they're gonna lose if they stay the same, as well as the potential upside and gain, and you had a much more contrasting story than if you just showed the possible benefit or gain. And you tell that story in contrast. So the idea here is that the brain needs contrast to make a decision and overcome selection difficulty. You have to introduce contrast into the story. But that was a hypothesis based on the neuroscience I just shared. We had to go out and actually test this. And once again, we put people into a purchase scenario where we took them right up to the point of purchase and, and, and telling them a story about something new they could buy or something new they could choose. And we measured them across these four elements. And we wanted to see if we could affect their choice by putting some people in a condition where they only saw the future only new and improved different benefits and others in the position where they heard a summary of what more than likely was the current state they had and what the contrasting new alternative was and see, to see if contrast could move the needle on people's purchase intent, attitudes and choice, advocacy and product perceptions. And here's what we got. In the first area of interest and likelihood of making a purchase, if you tell a story that adds contrast between the current state and the future state, you can increase the likelihood of making a purchase by more than 14, nearly 15%. Think about it. Just by telling a before and after current state, future state story, instead of just a new and improved story, you can get a, almost a 15% bump in their likelihood to do something, to, to create intention. Now you're looking at the three bars below, and, and just to give you a sort of a sense of what we did in the test, is one group went into the future only condition, another group went and saw a contrast story, but it was contrast on the same screen, top and bottom, the current state on the top, future state on the bottom. The second group saw contrast on separate screens, screen one, screen two, and the third group saw contrast side by side, left and right. We were trying to figure out if there was a different way to talk about display and, and, and show contrast 
if that would have an effect. Lo and behold, it really did not have a statistically significant different effect. The effect was in that you need to show contrast. Your story must include contrast. Selection difficulty is overcome by clearly showing contrast. Absent contrast, they won't overcome selection difficulty. You will not actually demonstrate value. Attitudes and choice. We asked them if they would be willing to switch from their current thing they're using. In this case, the test was about a professional grade mobile smartphone. Or willing to switch even though they had their phone for only a year. And their willingness to actually pay more for this new phone increased by over 14% when the story was told with contrast. If your stories today do not have contrast, you are seriously um, constraining your ability to sell with that story. You might be saying, how can we describe the customer's current state? We don't know the customer's current state. The customer knows the customer's current state. Oh, on the contrary. Customers, prospects, and our research tell us all the time, hey, you see more people who look like me than I do, so tell me what you're seeing. Help me understand what everybody else is doing out there. And so the reality is you can go out there and say, based on the hundreds or thousands of companies we, we work with that look just like you, this is what we see in the current state. And at a minimum, you put a straw man up there for people to react to and you create engagement. But at, 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 at its best, that helps anchor people to understand because sometimes they don't even know what their current state is because that decision was an amalgamation of many decisions over years with multiple decision makers. And your clarity of what's going on in their organization because you've seen more organizations that look like them than they do is actually a gift to them. Look at this. If you put your story in contrast, they're actually more likely to tell others about it. It spurs them to think, this is something I ought to share. And it improves the perceptions that you have a breakthrough. We're always trying to you know, tell a story that says ours is a breakthrough. Well, it turns out it's harder to perceive a breakthrough in the absence of contrast. Way more easy for people to see a breakthrough when the story is done in contrast. Tell a story with contrast. Value lies in the contrast. Current state to future state and the change and the outcome in between. That's how you do number three. Overcome selection difficulty by creating enough contrast. So we've talked about destabilizing preferences when people have preference stability by introducing unconsidered needs. We've talked about how people have an anticipated cost associated with change and they think the status quo is free. You need to show them the cost of staying the same by provoking loss aversion and risk seeking by showing them that they can't stay the same and here's the cost. And the cost of staying the same, the pain of staying the same might be greater than the pain of change. In fact, it is. You have to then show them the contrast, that they have selection difficulty, and in order to overcome that, they have to see clear contrast, and even an emphasis on see, because the part of the brain you're aiming at doesn't have the capacity for language. Words are not necessarily contrasting. Visuals are. And then ultimately, now you have to help them see themselves in a position of succeeding, because the natural inclination at the end of all this is they still have an anticipated regret and blame. So. Here's what I'm going to tell you about overcoming regret and blame. You need to carefully construct your case studies and proof points as before and after stories that leverage all of the things you just talked about. Case studies and, 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 um, and preference uh, proof points need a clear before and after that map to the unconsidered needs and destabilizing preferences you talked about that map to the pain and cost of staying the same and map to the current state um, risks, gaps, challenges. And then shows that customer prospect identifying that they're in that condition and then successfully navigating that and, and uh, coming out a hero on the other side as having accomplished what you promised. The key that, that the world has discovered, and in particular our science comes from Alcoholics Anonymous, is Alcoholics Anonymous identified a long time ago that people are more persuaded when they self-persuade. Self-persuasion is the most powerful form of persuasion. So what you're doing with this story is increasing the possibility that someone's going to try on the story, identify with the story, and persuade themselves that this story is about them. And Alcoholics Anonymous discovered you can't tell somebody, here's an alcoholic, I mean, you're an alcoholic, so change, and you can't convince someone to change when you show somebody all cleaned up. You actually have to tell a story that starts with the bad news, the, 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 the condition they were in and help somebody self-identify with, you know, that's me, that's where I'm at. And instantly they start trying on the rest of the story, they start participating in the story, and they start seeing themselves in that position of moving from the current to the future state. Make sure your case studies and proof points 
have good before and after contrasting stories that make the customer self-persuade and identify themselves in the story and connect with the hero of the story, which is someone who looks just like them, making the decisions and choices that you just laid out for your prospect and customer. So the power of your story lies in your ability to overcome the status quo bias. Your ability to be compelling and tell a story that wins is your ability to overcome this natural inertia to stay the same and make no decision. And make no mistake that a decision to stay the same is not a decision for the incumbent competitor. That is not a head-to-head -head competition. It is a decision on, as to whether or not they want to actually go through the change process. And that is more about change management principles than it is about classic selling ideas. That's why what you're seeing today is rooted in the decision sciences, neuroscience, behavioral economics, and social psychology, the root of change management being translated into story development for marketing and sales. So I offer these to you today, and I am representing. This is a picture just before I went on the air. Viva Knievel. Uh, you know, it's, it's more than 40 years later, but I'm still representing. Uh, thank you very much, and um, I'm happy to open it up to questions. Um, and that selfie, by the way, was to check another box to tell my daughters I actually posted a selfie in one of my webcasts. I'm open to questions, but I want to show you that, and it's case uh, uh, sensitive, uh, we want to share a research brief with you on one of the most compelling pieces of research we talked about today, uh, messaging to the unconsidered need, and you can get that by going online to this link right here. Um, Steve, we're at 45 minutes. Let's uh, let's take some questions. Fantastic, Tim. That, that's great stuff and uh, uh, really invaluable, not not just for sales but for marketers like myself as well. So so really appreciate that. So. Uh, Let's go ahead and open, the, open it up to questions, uh, and as a reminder, you can still submit questions through the uh, questions pane in your attendee control panel. Uh, let's see. Okay, Tim, first question here. Your concepts focused on when you are trying to get someone off of the status quo, really a customer acquisition play. What if you are the status quo and you want people to stay? <laughs> so, so I get this question almost every time I tell this story is, Hey man, what if you are the status quo? We got X, X, Y market share and, and our big challenge is renewals, right? So I think that's an interesting question and you must, the audience is going to have to stay tuned um, because that is the most recent test that we did with our partner, Zach Tramala, Dr. Tramala. Um, he and us, we put conditions together in a renewal situation and created different pitches based on all the science that we know. Some were using this same methodology at renewal time, and another one was a methodology that actually deliberately reinforced the status quo bias, like deliberately reinforced the preferences. Hey, um, you made a decision a couple years ago, you went through a long, tedious process, you had to gain consensus from multiple decision makers, you invested in some ramp up time and some change management, um, and here's the progress we've made to date. Um, and, and continue to like deliberately poke at the status quo bias and reaffirm them, uh, getting preference stability, um, talking about the cost of what it would be like to make a change because you've already put in a lot of cost a couple of years ago. And I will give you a hint. Interestingly enough, we discovered that, in fact, at renewal time, you need to reinforce the status quo bias deliberately using these four biases in order to improve your chances for a renewal, that provoking someone and trying to disrupt their status quo bias actually had the counter effect of causing them to open their minds up to reconsidering alternatives because you were essentially exposing the fact that there might be alternative ways to, to continue to solve this problem. So I, it's going to be interesting. I just want to give that as a teaser. Be watching for our webcast. But um, if you are the status quo, status quo bias, it looks like at renewal time specifically, when you simply want to keep the wheels on and, and, and flip that into a renewal, uh, is your friend and, and be deliberate about it. Great. Thanks, Tim. Uh, next question here. Uh, would this process only work with a, with a complex sale? Simple sales will probably be fruitful with relationship selling. Simple sales will be fruitful with relationship selling. I guess if you're talking about transactional sales, um, I think the irony there is that Simple transactional types of sales doesn't even give you enough time to really develop a relationship unless it's an ongoing series of transactions. And I think what's interesting is most companies are deciding to take that to a much lower cost model 
and take those kinds of sales inside and take the cost of all that relationship building off the table because the, the margin on the sale, the transaction on the sale means they need a lower cost model. So I think what's interesting is that what we're going to find is that in that as companies migrate, it's almost like there's going to be no sales middle class eventually. There's going to be the big strategic account managers on the big strategic accounts and complex accounts. And then there's going to be inside sales cranking on transactional, simpler uh, business. And you aren't going to have time to build a relationship or the forum to build a relationship. I don't have time to get into this today, but I've been doing a lot of research and study on how do you increase um, the speed and velocity of building a relationship um, when you don't have time to build a relationship. Let's say you migrate to a new selling model where you, you don't have relationship sellers because it's a low-cost model for transactional sales. And it turns out I was looking at all these environments where people become fast friends and bosom buddies, even though may, they might be opposites, political opposites, religious opposites, I don't care, ethnic opposites, whatever it is, they're on total opposite ends of the spectrum. And they all galvanize and become fast friends the day a flood hits their town or a tornado hits their town or a hurricane hits their town. It's like a crisis bonds people who would never, ever otherwise be bonded, and they're galvanized to solve that problem or challenge. I don't have any proof for this and haven't tested it, but the research, you know, people from diametrically opposed parts of the spectrum get in a foxhole in a war together and they're buddies for life. A crisis or a shared challenge, which is what I'm recommending here, is you, you get on the other side of the desk and you both peer into the world at this challenge and talk about how to resolve it, creates a faster bond than the years it takes to create relationships. And I'm just thinking there's going to be something to that. I don't have any research for it yet, but I offer that. Um, I'm not going to dismiss the fact that if you have years and years of relationship and people continue to buy their paper products from you or whatever it might be, that could be fruitful. But I am suggesting that what I'm seeing in the space is that um, there is a bifurcation of the sales structure and we're going to see a, a decrease in the sales middle class. And, and that's where some of that relationship stuff kind of still lives, to be honest. It's just an opinion. That is not a fact, folks. Great. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for that. Um, uh, this is a great question. How, how do these concepts resonate in other cultures? I'm doing training next month in our China and Japan offices. So I love the culture question because um, it's, 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 it gets to the heart of these ideas. These are ideas rooted in decision science, not rooted in best practices. The thing about best practices when you say, oh, here's the best practice of a salesperson. Look what they do. Here's the best practice of a marketing person. Look what they do. Those often have cultural and geographic differences um, because practices are different. The thing that doesn't actually change is the way your brain is designed and actually the functional way it makes decisions. In fact, some of the leading edge research um, for decision making sciences that I read about in the journals is coming out of India and it's coming out of China and other places where you can run these tests at a low cost because many of these tests are used in use incentives, cash incentives to see what people will do. And it turns out you can use a lot less cash in those countries to get these results so you can get a bigger study. And it turns out the results keep confirming all the other test results. And so what I'm going to say is that people are sort of physiologically wired the same way in their decision making regardless of culture. There may be some protocol and some other practices that change, but actually when it comes to the way people frame value and make choices in the parts of the brain that do that work, we're all kind of designed the same. So this is the most globally responsive and responsible way of approaching things, way more better than best practices, which may not translate across um, uh, geographies. Uh, th thanks, Tim. Uh, next question here. What if the competition introduces the same unconsidered need and the conversation becomes beneficial to the customer for more options slash choices? So um, if the existing incumbent, I'm guessing, introduces the same unconsidered need. Um, so it's interesting, right? I think it, <laughs> again, I don't want to preview the new study too much. It probably depends on the timing. If the existing customer expresses the unconsidered need right at renewal time, what we've discovered is that creates an opportunity and an opening. Um, if they're very creative and productive during their relationship and continue to share insights with their customer, I think the 7426 rule comes into effect. The first one to inspire and create the buying vision is need to change and do something different wins. So what I would say as the non-incumbent, you have got to be first, you've got to be fast, and you got to be the one providing the story and put your competitor, incumbent, 
on the defensive. We've seen time and time again that when, when somebody's come in and said, hey, why haven't you switched from analog to digital yet? Look at all the advantages of digital. And the current provider offers both analog and digital. The customer goes to the, their provider, why didn't you tell me about the digital stuff? Well, it turns out because analog was more profitable and they didn't want to rush the transition. Well, that ticked off the customer. That's how, you know, that, I guess what I'm saying is if you're the first one to point out this opportunity and it turns out the incumbent has something similar to offer, they're gonna, that's going to frustrate the customer as to why the incumbent didn't bring it up and why they continued to possibly sub-optimize their solution. Was it for profit? Was it for margin? What was it? So I would still every day try to be the one to dislodge the status quo incumbent by being the one who um, disrupts it with the unconsidered need. Thanks, Tim. Uh, next question here. How can one lower the barriers of story adoption? Um, barriers of story adoption. I'm going to guess maybe by the sales force. Um, you build a new story, and does the sales force actually use the story um, versus the customer? I'm going to have to guess here unless that person wants to type you a note. Um, overcoming the barriers to story adoption. Let's just say you create a really new, fabulous story in this new way I just described. To the salesperson you're giving it to, if they haven't really understood why you built the story this way, it's going to be like a foreign object. And I always give this analogy that um, uh, of like a heart transplant. You know, if you need a heart transplant, it's because your current heart is killing you. And if you don't get a new heart, you're going to be dead. If you get a new heart, your body doesn't go, yay, we're saved. Your body tries to reject the new heart, the very thing that's trying to save it. So the natural reaction to something foreign, like a new story like this in a different way with counterintuitive approaches is, oh my gosh, uh, to reject it. This is so different. The key to actually making a story acceptable is that you help teach the salespeople the understanding of why the story is the way it is, teach them the same science behind why it's constructed so they start to see how smart the story is and, and, and do that as you roll out the message, ideally roll out the skill and the knowledge uh, that's built into the story. Otherwise, it just looks like a foreign object. They don't realize how smart it is. It just looks like something uh, different, and, and we just talked about change management, right? So there actually has to be a, a, a skills and knowledge change uh, component to a good new story rollout, if, if, the, if I understood the question right, that it was about getting salespeople to adopt the story. Okay, next question here. Uh, how do we present our story when we are pitching something that most people have no experience with, like strategic planning? We had one client tell us, you can't sell this. You need to experience it to know how valuable it is. How do we get them to trust the after state? Yeah, and that's a hard one, right? Um, uh, the idea that I don't kind of know where to put this. This isn't tangible enough. I've, I haven't done it. So I'm not, I don't have a basis in comparison. Uh, I don't have a current state, if you will. Um, one of the tools that we, we like to use is the idea of, of creating sort of a, an analogous metaphor, helping um, uh, say, hey, this is, um, you've made this decision before, not in this category that we're talking about, but you've made a decision similar to this before in something else. We recently worked with a company that was trying to convince municipalities, first responders, police, fire, and others, that they needed to get off of the consumer network to get off their AT&T, get off their Verizon, and purchase a private network for their voice and data. Because, hey, first responders and the data they need and the communications they need uh, deserves a private network. But that wasn't something that was in anybody's comprehension. So we did two things. First, we had to show them why the consumer network they were using, the public network, was least available when they most needed it because it was coming down, because of too much traffic on it. When there was a crisis, the public network would simply come down. Or sometimes when there was a crisis, the police would take it down so people didn't use it to communicate. But the problem is when you take it down for the bad guys, you took it down for the good guys. So we showed them there were some holes in the current state. But they didn't get the future state, a private network. So what we said is, hey, think about it this way. When you go to fight a fire at a house, you don't go to the neighboring house and ask for their garden hose. You need a dedicated pipe. You need a fire hydrant, and you've institutionalized that because the only way as a first responder to do your job right is to have a dedicated pipe, spec designed and performing exactly as you need it, 
not relying on the fellow consumer neighbors, uh, you know, the public uh, access. Similar to your voice and data, you need a private pipe. So we created that, we put it in the context of a decision they had made before that had gone really well for them and now seems like a no-brainer, and that gave them a metaphor where they can go, I get it. I'm, I'm making, I, I need a pipe for my data and voice like I needed a pipe for my water. So hopefully that made sense to people. Thanks, Tim. Uh, I think we have time for one more question here. Uh, how do you go about finding the unconsidered needs? Yeah, so the unconsidered need can't be just some interesting industry fact and some sizzly surprising piece of data if it doesn't connect to something you can do. There's really two reasons for that. If you tell somebody your hair's on fire and then you don't have a bucket of water, I guess I'm keeping my analogies together here, you're just a jerk, all right? I mean, hey, your hair's on fire. And then the customer's like, what, what, what do I do? And, and you don't have a way to resolve it. That's, that's not good news on a couple of fronts. One, it just makes you a jerk. Number two, they start looking for someone who does have a bucket of water, and now your discussion is over. Um, and also, if there's no resolution to the risk, here's the science in the brain that's going on. If I'm told my status quo is unsafe, I emotionally respond and my survival mechanism kicks in, now I'm looking for a new safe. And if I don't see a new safe, I immediately return to what I was the only last safe I knew, which is my current state. And so then I'd sort of just hunker down, further retrench, and duck and hope this too shall pass. And if there's no new safe or alternative to go to, that means everybody's up the same creek without a paddle as I am, so I just shrug my shoulders. The idea is that, that the brain is looking for a new safe path, and, and we've got additional tests I didn't have time for today that showed that the emotional response and the persuasive response when you introduce risk only is significantly lower than if you introduce risk with resolution. We can get double-digit increases in emotional response and behavior change by introducing risk with resolution versus risk only. So that's what people have to be careful about. So as a result, if you have to be able to solve it, the real story lives in those unique, distinct strengths you have that people don't care about if you shoehorn them into the red box. But if you can reverse engineer those up into a legitimate need the customer didn't spot or didn't fully appreciate and tell a great story around that need and then lead them to that strength, now you have a story with risk and resolution. Now you have a story that causes people to respond. Now you have a story that your salespeople will actually use because actually you can sell something with it. Um, and so it solves all the problems internally for adoption and it solves all the problems externally with the psychology of decision making. So reverse engineering from your unique strength up to an unconsidered need is step one. Okay, thanks Tim, really appreciate that. And looks like we've run out of time. So uh, I, I wanna go ahead and, and thank everybody for attending today's webinar. And if we were unable to get to your question during the webinar, we'll do our best to answer each question individually after the webinar. Um, so on behalf of Tim and myself, thank you for joining us today and uh, please have a great rest of your day.